Hi, I'm Tim, and welcome to Perpetually Patek. Today we have an enthusiast after my own heart. I can identify with this guy, a former Navy man, a car enthusiast, and of course, a connoisseur of Patek Philippe. Louis, welcome to the show. Tim, it's great to be here with you. I appreciate the invite. So now, tell me about how you got started with watches, because nobody starts with Patek Philippe. It started early. Yes, when I was young, probably seven or eight years of age, my grandmother and I would uh, walk the streets of Lisbon. I was walking, this is mid-70s, walking down the- In Portugal. Uh, yeah, in Lisbon, Portugal. And as I'm walking down the street, I'm looking at these new digital watches in the display cases of the jewelry stores. And I was just blown away. This was the transition between analog and digital timepieces. And that, that's really what captured my attention and uh, you know, got me started into watches. Kind of captured your imagination. Yeah. Now, when did you actually start to buy watches for yourself? Probably after high school, sometime around that. Uh, probably started with some Casios and other things of that nature. Relatively inexpensive watches, probably all I could afford at the time. But now, the first big watch, you kind of went back to where you started with the combination of the quartz and yeah, digital and analog, an unusual Navitimer, taking me back to the 90s now. Yeah, I finished flight school and I decided to get a nice watch as a, you know, a gift for myself. And I picked a Breitling, which has aviation tones to it. And I decided on the Breitling Navitimer, which was a pretty cool timepiece with both the analog and a digital display. Now, as you moved on with your career in aviation, uh, you moved on to bigger watches, and I think you got into Omega, really, a, a little bit, the end of the 90s? Yeah, I, I really wanted a Rolex Submariner at the time, but it was just way above my budget. So I settled on an Omega Seamaster. And it's funny, because I think I also settled for an Omega Seamaster at one point when I wanted a Submariner, right around that same time. And you eventually came to realize that there was another brand in the same shop. So how did that happen? The salesperson, uh, Ruben, he brought me over, and as he walked me over to the other case, he showed me this piece. It was a 5396G, and I just fell in love with it. Uh, you know, love at first sight, the dial, the case, the size, uh, it reminded me of a 1950s type of watch, and I thought, well, that, this is really cool and quite different than what I was used to. And plus, I had a display back. I wasn't really used to display back watches up until that time. And so I, I made the plunge. It was quite a bit more than the watches I'd been buying up until that point. So, um, I, you know, I, I took the plunge and I bought the 5396. You're still in the Navy at that point. No, actually, at the time, I had actually retired from the military. So it was a little bit past that. Now, did you originally walk into the shop looking for the Patek Philippe, or is that what you wound up with? You know, I'm embarrassed, but I didn't even, I hadn't even heard of Patek Philippe at the time when I went over there to look at this particular uh, timepiece. Okay. So having then imbibed of the grape, uh, you were hooked. Yes. Where did it go from there? From that Piece, I went to a 5712-1A back when you could still get them right off of the showroom there. In, in the case, it was there? In the case, it was right there. And he had several, he had several Iconauts, several Nautiluses. Uh, to be perfectly honest, the first time I saw a Nautilus, I was not enamored with it. And the 5712, maybe because it was also asymmetrical, um, kind of threw me off a little bit. But then it kind of grew on me. And, uh, and I got that piece and I've had several Nautiluses ever since. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. One of which is because it's a 1970s type of watch uh, or look, and I have uh, an affinity towards that time period. It's one of the happiest times of my life, 1970s. Uh, in addition to that, of course, there is the nautical theme, and uh, Portugal, where I'm from, has a great nautical history, not to mention the fact that I myself was in the Navy. So a uh, few little attractions there brought me to that. It takes you back to your heart, it takes you back to your childhood. Also, the era when you sort of came of age as a watch enthusiast, when as a kid looking at those, I guess it was quartz watches in the window. That's right. Now, speaking of Nautilus, you've actually got two interesting ones here. Uh, one is very, very practical. 5991A, water resistant, loomed, auto, steel, travel time, flyback chronograph. And then we have something here that is profoundly impractical but wonderfully rare, 5711-111P. 
Um, these come from two different ends of the practicality spectrum. So first, walk me through this watch that you're traveling with, the 5990, blue dial. The 57, I'm sorry, the 5991A-011, in particular, I, I love the blue dial on it. And it's, it's a nuanced dial, right? So it's not blue as in a 5711. It, uh, it really, it, it plays on the light from the sun. Uh, I love the travel time function. I travel a lot and I get a lot of use out of that uh, function. Plus I love the way that the pushes are integrated on the backside of the case there at nine o'clock. And the great thing is it really does integrate both the chronograph and the travel time without destroying the gent design. You think of the watch that's highly symmetrical with a lot of nuance to its shape, adding complications would kind of spoil it, but it's really quite subtle. And for me, it's also remarkably thin. It's only about half a millimeter thicker than a Daytona. Yeah, no, it, it's a great everyday watch. It's probably the one that I travel with the most because of its functionality, its look. Uh, it's stainless steel, so it's not too heavy. And I, that blue dial is just amazing uh, in the sunlight. And it really is quite killer. And everything about this watch sort of surprises because being a newer version of the 5990, uh, it does away with one of the longtime weaknesses of the Nautilus. And you go back to the 5712, this new bracelet is incredible. You got two incremental adjustments, a more robust clasp. Uh, talk about the change that made since you've owned both versions, past and present. I, I really love this version. I also love the other one. The clamshell is thinner profile, yeah. but what I like about this one, as you mentioned, is the adjustability. I can't tell you how many times I've left the house with a Nautilus on a clamshell clasp, and it's loose when I leave the house, and 30 minutes later, it's cutting off my circulation because there's no adjustability. And uh, they, they fixed that with this particular uh, clasp, and I, I really like it. And the nice thing too is like, you know, once you've got a bracelet format, you're locked into the link sizing. So if you're in between link sizes, you can add, subtract, but you can't cut them in half. With this, you do have that little bit of extra give. And I've actually spoken to some people who bought recent Nautiluses and they've been surprised that this is included. They're like, I didn't actually know it had that. It's not well advertised. Yeah, it's almost a mix of the Nautilus bracelet and the Aquanaut bracelet. It kind of reminds me a little bit of that. Yeah, I definitely get that. When you, the rare occasions you see an Aquanaut on a bracelet, it does feel like it's got the same like twin trigger internal. Now, this is an interesting watch because a lot of people will tell you that the 5711 is dead. And for the most part, that's true. But on a very limited basis, incredible things are still possible with the 5711. Tell me about how you learned about this series because frankly, even I didn't know about it until a few years back. I think I learned about it from uh, Instagram, to be honest. I uh, just, I'm always on there looking at pictures and seeing uh, the models that are out there. And I'd never heard of it at the time. Of course, it's an off catalog piece. It's not advertised, it's not in any of the literature. So I was surprised when I first saw it. The fact that it's in four different uh, gem settings. So we've got the emerald, the ruby, the sapphire, and the diamond. And of course, different uh, dials as well as case materials. This particular one, caught my eye because uh, one, I like blue. Uh, two, it is subtle compared to the other variants. And three, blue happens, uh, sapphire happens to be my birthstone as well. So the, those three things put together made this a perfect piece for me. Really special. And it's just the idea that the 5711 does live on off the catalog, uh, pretty much only as an art piece. Cause you've got the setting in the bezel, you've got the setting on the dial, this super subtle blue lacquered hand, and just the unbelievable mass of platinum. You were telling me everyone who holds it remarks the same thing. Yeah. Every time I give somebody to hold a full bracelet platinum watch, first words out of their mouth is, oh wow, because it's just so unexpected. You know, it, it looks like a, a light watch. You know, you, you expect it to be somewhat similar to other similar watches. Yeah, and I do see what you mean. The older Nautilus bracelet and the older Nautilus clasp architecture, super thin in combination. Really, the clasp doesn't add any thickness to the bracelet. Um, it, there's definitely something to be said for both the new and the old. There is something to be said for the slim profile of tradition, especially since the 5711, by its nature, is a really thin watch. Yeah, and as you mentioned in all your videos, uh, Paddock makes every part of the watch in platinum which is kind of nice. They don't uh, make the class white gold. Yeah, and that is very important because a lot of companies will say, oh, well, it's out of sight, out of mind. White gold's a better mechanical material. Just use white gold. 
if you can use platinum, that says something about both your integrity as a company and also, frankly, your engineering chops because you're able to make it work. Not an easy thing. When I wear this watch, I definitely know that I'm wearing it because of the, of the heft. Without a doubt. Speak softly, but carry a big stick. Actually, here's a big stick right here. You're talking a little bit about the Aquanaut. Now, this is not an Aquanaut on a bracelet. This is kind of a fun, dress down, hot weather, you know, hair down sports watch. Very different in character from the Nautilus. How'd you find your way into the Aquanaut Chrono? And the partic that particular piece, as you just mentioned, I mean, it's just fun, you know? And of course it comes with the two bracelets, the black and the orange composite. And I've only had it on the orange. I, I love it, it, uh, it stands out, it just, it just screams fun. And of course, I love the fact that in this particular model, you've got the uh, orange accents throughout the dial, uh, which is really kind of uh, cool, you know, because so the, the bracelet kind of plays on the, on the dial. And the way I acquired this particular one, um, you know, out of about 40 paddocks that I own, uh, that's only my second Aquanaut, one of two that I have. Uh, so I'm not a big Aquanaut purchaser, but that particular one uh, is just so much fun that I couldn't, uh, couldn't help myself. There's kind of two different facets of you here. You know, you've got the conservative blue gem set platinum Nautilus. You've got the loud, vibrant, extravagant orange Aquanaut. You've sort of got like the fire and ice. They have very different personalities to them. And color can make a big difference. I don't think you ever had eyes for the 5270, you were telling me before, until you saw this model, and it almost didn't happen. Yeah, the, the 5270, of course, it had big shoes to fill, right, coming after the 5970, which is a, a much revered reference. Uh, the 5270 at first, it didn't appeal to me in the other models so much until I saw this particular one. Uh, everything about it is special. From the platinum case, of course, you've got the rose gold dial, which in the past, certain of these features between that and the Arabic numerals, were only seen on one-off models or very limited production. I think Eric Clapton had a 3970, a 5004, and a 5970 in rose gold. Uh, and that's all, the only time you ever saw those. So here was one that was much more approachable. Uh, and that's what drew my attention to it. However, that being said, the cost of it was much more than what I'd spent on previous models. So it was a big step up for me. And I really literally waited till the last minute. Uh, Paddock discontinued this particular version. My AD had one um, on their display. I went back and forth on it. And probably after about 30 days, I gave them a call to tell them that I was ready to purchase it. And they told me they literally just sold it 30 minutes prior. So I was, I was quite upset um, and uh, I was beating myself up about it. And then one or two days later, my AD contacted me and they said, you know, Paddock never does this, but we called them up and they're gonna give us one additional uh, allocation uh, in addition to the last one that we had. So I was able to go back in and pick up the watch uh, even after it was been discontinued. Yeah, I mean, they made it from about, I wanna say like 2018 until the green dial arrived in 2022. And it's not something that was ever turned out at a high rate. It was always going to be something special, being the perpetual calendar chronograph, sort of a core reference for them going back to the 1940s. This is a watch that is the heart and soul of Patek. People think Nautilus, they think sports watch today, but perpetual calendar chronograph, that's, that's really what set Patek apart in the middle decades of the 20th century. Did you ever think that you wanted the complication specifically, or was it just a reaction, a visceral reaction to the color combo? No, it'd been on my radar. Of course, this is a flagship model for Paddock with an incredible lineage dating back to the 1518, you know, 2499 and so on. So yes, it was a reference that uh, certainly a set of complications that were of interest to me, uh, but it just was pushing my uh, budget envelope a little bit at the time when, uh, when I was looking into it. And you know, there was a lot of sort of churn in the design of the dial. When it first came out in 2011, there was no tachymeter, there was no chin, not everyone liked that look. They added the tachymeter, not everyone liked that. They did away with part of the tachymeter, they got rid of the chin. This is really sharp. Uh, we could talk a little bit about some of the specific features like the blackening of the white gold numerals and indices and hands. Yeah, that's a, a great part of it that I really like. Of course, I mentioned the Arabic numerals. And unlike the other versions, every other version, it doesn't have the batons there. And, um, so I really like the, the numerals on it. Again, reminiscent to some of the special models from before. And this particular 
rose gold dial is different than others. One of the things that I've noticed is that in all of the paddock uh, watches with rose gold dials, they're not all the same. There are different shades, different hues, and this is, you know, one of my favorite. For example, the 5172 that is out right now has a different, lighter shade of, of rose gold. This particular one, to me, is just perfect. I, I can't think of a, a better shade of it. Got a beautiful intensity to it. Also, highlighting the case design here, you can really see how far Patek Philippe case making has come. This isn't just like a blended lug profile. It's not a simple fabrication. There are steps, there's fluting, there's different creases, curves, a concave bezel. It's a really interesting shape. It's, I think, a worthy successor to the 5970 from that standpoint, for sure. I know that uh, there are some people that uh, don't care for the uh, movement. Uh, because they moved away from the Lemania movement, you know, to an in-house movement. I really love every every part of this watch. The movement, I think, is beautiful. It fills up the case nicely, unlike some other watches where you have the movement so much smaller than the case. Uh, I think they did a fantastic job. I like the pushers. I like everything about it. I really don't find any flaw with this particular one. I mean, if I was going to be really nitpicky, it would be the date apertures on the front uh, that are white instead of rose gold behind there. That would be the only thing that I could nitpick on that, on this particular reference. Well, the perfect watch has yet to be made. But fortunately, um, the good thing about being a watch collector is you're always open-minded, always willing to try new things, always willing to give another chance to reach perfection. We talked about the sophistication of Patek case making with the 5270. It's also true for the 5230 series, but this is the 5231G, and this is very special, not so much for what's on the outside, but what's on the inside. How did this watch happen? This particular piece, uh, I mean, first of all, I, I love the rare handcrafts from, from Patek, and this is probably, I would have to say, the most accessible rare handcraft, um, almost. Uh, there might be an, an ellipse there or something like that uh, engraved that might be a little more accessible. But having visited the Paddock Museum, I absolutely was mesmerized with all of the enamel dials that they have there. Uh, just intricate works of art. And when this one came about, uh, I got a call. I had just literally just purchased the 5224. It hadn't come in yet, but I just purchased it. And on my drive home, my head D calls me and says, hey, we just found out we're getting a 5231. Do you want it? Of course I wanted it, but I just couldn't. It was just too close to the, the last purchase, which was literally minutes ago. And I passed on it and I said, you know, as much as I wanted, I just can't swing two watches at the same time. And I went back a few weeks later to pick up the 5224. And they happened to have that one in the safe. I think it was already reserved for somebody else. I said, well, to bring it out, let me take a look at it. He brought it out, I looked at it, and I said, mm, uh, it, I had to have it. So I, I told him, can you make sure that the person is actually gonna pick this up? And uh, they said, all right, we'll, we'll give them a call. And I got a call about maybe two, three days later, and they said, you know, we can't get a hold of the client that is supposed to get this piece, so you can have it. So I went back and I picked up you know, this piece literally two days after the 5224. And uh, so and I'm, I'm very happy that I was It was only that. possible yeah. because the guy who had previously basically secured it bugged out. Pretty much, yeah. Didn't, didn't return the, the call. That's a fantastic watch. I have to say, all things considered, it's a very different watch from the one that preceded it. A 5131 seems very big, but also in terms of form, a little bit indistinct. Talk about, I guess, what changed that caused a shift in your heart, because you say this one specifically grabbed you. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a 5130R as well. And I also have a 5230P. Uh, just to me, the enamel was what made all the difference. The opportunity to have an enamel piece, it is gorgeous. It's an amazing work of art. I've been to the manufacturer. I've seen them work on these pieces. And uh, it was just something that I thought was, I didn't want to pass up and lose the opportunity to, to get this one. As you mentioned on the 5130 series before, it's a larger case. That one is 39 and a half millimeters. This one is 38 and a half. Where is great. Uh, the case is, is quite different than the other one. The other one is much more rounded. Um, and this particular one, um, I, I just, I love the way it looks. I love the way the, the blue alligator strap in matte plays on the dial color. Uh, this is a great uh, reference. You're also saying that you liked the relocation of the Patek logo from the exterior on the bezel on the 5131 to the dial of the 5231. Yeah, I think it looks a lot better that way. 
before in the previous series, they had it on the bezel on the top and bottom. It would say Patek Philippe, and then on the bottom, Geneva. Um, I think it looks a lot cleaner and nicer this way, and that's usually where you're used to seeing the, the brand name is on the dial, not so much on the, on the case. And for tradition's sake, you know, having it on the dial is really something to be said for that. But also, I've seen from a practical standpoint, because the lettering is lacquered, on the uh, 5131, you, you, there is a tendency if you wear it a lot that your cuff could wear down the lacquer. So it's also a practical decision. Now a lot of folks, that you can't realize just by looking at a glance, because it's so well proportioned, but that center cloisonne enamel section, it's only about the size of a dime. You went to the manufacturer, you actually saw the fabrication of bracelets, of dials, of cases. Tell me what you saw that really that really moved you on that front. Well, the Cleanliness of the, you know, and the, I mean, the whole thing looked like a, a NASA office building. Um, it was unbelievable. I saw so many, uh, I don't know how they keep track of all the diamonds and, and sapphires and all the gem setting rooms. Uh, you know, the people, they all work in unison. So particular shops will work uh, at one time and then they take breaks together. And the amount of focus that is required, I cannot imagine having that kind of focus for such a long period of time, usually you're in an office setting or almost any setting, you can kind of chat a little bit with your colleagues and so on. You have to have such a tremendous focus on what you're doing because the slightest uh, imperfection, I mean, it's gonna be magnified. I mean, anything that you do, if your hand slips, anything like that, um, it's gonna make a mess and uh, go back to the scrap pile. And I'm sure they're not happy about that. So you saw things like engraving, enameling, manufacturing of gem set pieces, but you also saw bracelet assembly and finishing, and you saw Nautilus bracelet construction. It was manual. Yeah, I mean, it's a, one of the things that I love about Paddock is how much manual work goes into every piece, right? Of course, there's machines to aid in certain aspects but of it. But the tools. Exactly, but every single part of the watch is finished by hand, even the parts that you won't see as a consumer. Uh, maybe only a watchmaker will see. Those are still finished by hand, and that is just very impressive, and I love the attention to detail that they put into every piece. Now, I love when you talked about the assembly of the Nautilus bracelets being done just bit by bit, surface by surface, because I know I've had people say, oh, you know, well, yeah, there are handmade Patek watches, but, you know, special pieces, not the general production, not the Nautilus, not the Aquanaut. That's not the case at all. No, I actually, I got the chance to see, you know, probably maybe 30 Nautilus bracelets in a row, which is so impressive to see in one uh, one sitting. But no, they have, there's a lot of uh, work that goes into every one of those pieces. And I mentioned to you earlier, Tim, that every one of us that left the factory, we all looked at each other. And we, we, you know, we thought we're not. They're not charging enough for these pieces. They're really worth so much more when you see the amount of uh, artisanship and craftsmanship and labor involved in every piece. And, you know, without talking numbers, they're also committed to holding down production more or less to where it is right now. Yeah, they, they, they're they holding steady, and their plan, according to what they told us, was that they plan on introducing more complicated timepieces, or at least have a greater percentage of their overall output to be complications as opposed to the more simple time-only uh, watches. And, and that makes sense, because if you want to grow a business, but you don't want to increase volume, premiumization, you know, this premiumization of the model line makes a lot of sense. Uh, richer products, not more products. There's an admirable integrity to that. And those are the things that have brought me to Paddock in the first place. So yes, I first fell in love with that 5396, but I knew nothing of Paddock at that time. But once I got into the brand, once I started uh, researching its history, uh, that's what really, uh, you know, brought me over and made me become passionate about Paddock. Uh, to me, personally, what I wear on my wrist says a lot about me, and I wanted to represent uh, the, you know, what I am and the values that I hold dear. And th they're very similar to many of the values that Paddock has, such as heritage, tradition, long-term view as opposed to short-term profit. You know, the, the uh, special Philippe Stern um, and Paddock in general, they do so many things that would not benefit the bottom line and the most companies would just not be able to do. Things like grand watch exhibitions every couple of years around the world. General admission, no cost of entry. You know, 
people that will never get a chance to own a Patek Philippe watch or even visit the museum get a chance to see these pieces right there. So it's obviously not just a marketing ploy. That's not a uh, you know, winning pro marketing proposition for sure. Now, I think it's important you mention the museum because a lot of people don't realize that, first of all, this museum is not self-serving. It's a museum of the history of watchmaking and clockmaking. It's not just Patek. But when they do those exhibitions in New York, in London, in Germany, they'll bring up to a quarter of the museum on the road with them. When you went to the museum, what did you see? Well, they have, as you mentioned, a couple of floors of just Patek Philippe watches, but then they also have history that predates Patek Philippe. So there's a lot of pieces. Of course, the whole thing is Mr. Stern's private collection, and it is just the most incredible collection of timepieces, I think, in the world, more, most likely. But again, it shows his love of orology and not just the, his brand, because he includes so many pieces that are you know, prior to the establishment of the Patek Philippe brand in the first place. Yeah, and if you look at the building itself, it's, it must cost a fortune just to keep that building as basically a non-revenue generating structure. It's the old Atelier Reuny case making building, and it's multiple floors. It's the entire history of portable timekeepers. You've got Italian made pocket watches from the Renaissance. You've got complications by Thomas Mudge and top English watchmakers. And it really does take you on a tour of the history of watchmaking. It's not like you're going to see some sort of you know, Patek Philippe pop-up store or advertisement. And the fact is all the watches work because they have a full-time curation staff that includes watchmakers. Yeah, they also have automatons. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned that, but uh, the automatons are just these beautiful works of art, mechanical um, things that, that you know, oh birds God, the singing things they can do. things pop out. Uh, no, they're just amazing. And the whole museum, I mean, I, I go there every time I go to Geneva and you see something new every time. It's just amazing. Now, looking forward, there is a lot more to your collection than what we have here today. It's not possible to travel with all of our watches. Um, but you do have some, some recent arrivals. I thought the, the 50 to 24 is an interesting one because it's so quirky, but how does that play to your, your tastes as a collector? There are many things that I like about the 50 to 24. One, I love, of course, the inspiration of the gondola watches because it has a 24-hour dial. Even though it's inverted, I find it more useful that way. But the travel time function, as I mentioned before, is one of my favorite uh, complications, very usable. And I love the way that they've integrated it into the crown as opposed to a set of pushers on the other side. That particular case, the movement is very similar to the 5236 movement, by the way. So it has the platinum rotor in the back, the micro rotor. The movement it is, is gorgeous. The watch is very thin. The uh, lugs, uh, it just um, it reminds me of uh, you know, something out of the 1940s or 50s. I think they drew a lot of inspirations from a lot of inspiration from past uh, watches. Oh, without a doubt. I think it's a fun piece because it's a dress watch, make no mistake. It's rose gold. It's a dress watch, but it's a very sporty dress watch. It's not a frumpy thing. It doesn't feel like, you know, you've got to be wearing tweed, smoking pipe tobacco and over 80 years old to wear that. Yeah, and I think that Paddock, you know, at least in the last 20 years, has introduced a lot of models that uh, start going melding into the, you know, to the sports I would side. I agree with that. Yeah. Right. So, and some of them you can actually wear them either, you know, in a sportiness or dressiness. So you could wear them in either uh, situation. Uh, so they're no longer just dress or just sports. Uh, models. Yeah, without a doubt. And I think it's important to note that as there's been less emphasis on the Nautilus line, like pulling back from the like meteoric rise of the 5711, there's been a little bit more room in the catalog to have other watches that are maybe a little bit more youthful, a little bit more sporty. You know, you've got the kind of silly and fun steel 5212A weekly calendar. Uh, you've got the uh, 5905 now available in a stainless steel full bracelet variant. And you got watches like the 5224 where maybe they're trying something that's just a little bit different, a different look, a different attitude, different character, an experimental watch, if you will. Yeah, you know, Thierry is now taking over the company, so I think he's putting his stamp on things. But one of the things that I really appreciate about uh, Paddock as a whole is that they never deviate from their core values in the long-term vision for the company. So when he when Terry discontinued the 5711, for instance, he's looking at the long-term viability of the company, and he doesn't want, as 
we all know, to, to regard Paddock as just a one-trick pony with just a Nautilus manufacturer. So I really appreciate the fact that they're still innovating, um, and, but still uh, drawing inspiration from, from the past. So there's that heritage and tradition uh, playing into the new designs. Yeah, and we've seen with the Royal Oak, and we've seen with you know, watches like the 50 Fathoms, it's very easy for a brand to fall into like an easy rut of selling something that's super popular, but also sort of becoming a prisoner of it. So, you know, when you look at other watches like the 6007G, it's just a sportier take on the traditional dress watch. Uh, the 5226, again, it's still a dress watch, but a very sporty one with a lot of loom, a lot of color, a lot of character. Um, where do you go with your collection? I know you have far more pieces than are here, but what are your future ambitions? Is it complications, application pieces, vintage? So I do have a few vintage pieces, but I'm more of a modern collector. I've had my eye on a mini repeater. That's my goal. I've been trying to get one for many years. I'm, I'm thinking it's gonna happen soon. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I love all the mini repeaters, but there are, they're so scarce. They're so hard to obtain. They're so hard to uh, get an allocation for, uh, but that's really what I'm shooting for is, uh, you know, probably at the top of my list would be a mini repeater. And you've got a couple of little, uh... I don't, I don't know how to describe them. They're not necessarily watches, but we were talking about other things Patek Philippe has made over time. You've worked with John Reardon. You've worked with many different dealers of new and pre-owned and vintage and special interest. You've got to tell me about this solar-powered clock. So it's an ellipse solar-powered clock made this particular one in 1981. I've got the extract from the archives, and it's just uh, it's amazing. You know, I, it, I use it as a desk piece. It never needs to be wound or anything. It's, uh, it's just solar powered, as you mentioned. It does not require a lot of light. And it looks a little bit like a, an ellipse dial. Uh, it's brass, it's very heavy, and um, it's just a gorgeous piece on my desk. Now, you also showed me these crazy liquid-fueled Patek Philippe lighters. This is off catalog. How did you even know to ask? Just, again, I, I think I was introduced to those by uh, John Reardon on, on his uh, website, Collectability, and uh, uh, they just, I. Paddock made all kinds of things in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, you know, everything from, uh, you know, as you mentioned before, pens and uh, letter, letter openers, openers yeah. et cetera. They have, uh, you know, just an incredible array of, of items. And uh, the lighter actually, you know, drew my attention uh, as well. I just thought it was kind of cool. And they've got a number of different variants of those with enamel and uh, they just- An engraving? You know, yeah. I think discovery is, is one of the great joys of the hobby, finding something we never knew existed and then being delighted that it does. For a lot of us, the process of identifying our grail watch is also a philosophical one. What is your grail watch, and do you believe a grail watch should be something that's actually obtainable? Yeah, for me, a, a grail watch is something that is practically unobtainable. And it could be due to a number of factors, and one of them could be, you know, financial aspect. Uh, some of my grill pieces would be just out of my reach, 1518, for instance, or uh, early 2499, uh, or many of the pieces that are in the Paddock Museum, those would be my grill pieces. So I try to keep a grill piece just out of reach. That would be what I would consider a grill. And for me, it would be one of the uh, Cloisonne, Cloisonne World Time pieces from the museum. Ooh, pulling from the Stern secret stash. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess that that is uh, a grail watch, something currently owned by Terry Stern himself. Um, all right, well, Lewis, thank you so much. This has been an absolute blast. If people want to find you online, they, let's say they want to follow your adventures, where do they go? My Instagram is I like paddocks. And that's it.